Thanks. Um, so first, I just want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to be a part of this program. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, my own group, especially Anna, Andreas, and Mariana, who uh, did all the kind of hard work uh, that I'll be talking about presenting today. And this work was also done in collaboration with uh, Jeff Kimball at Caltech. Um, so just to kind of give some, some background of, of where this idea is coming from, I just want to give a kind of brief introduction to atom-light interactions in, in general. Um, so it turns out atoms you know, kind of constitute a natural quantum interface with light. So even though atomic systems have been studied forever, I think we still kind of take for granted how remarkable a single atom is. So for example, you know, the kind of simplest model of an atom in terms of how it interacts with the light is a two-level system. Um, what that means is you, know, you can go from some atomic ground state up to some electronic excited state by shining in a laser. That's a classical field. Um, but as a two-level system, it can, this single atom can naturally only uh, absorb and re-emit single photons at a time. And that single photon is already a non-classical uh, state of light. Um, so that's been known for a long time, but in kind of recent years, um, this kind of non-classicality, so the ability to, to generate and manipulate non-classical states of light, um, that's made atomic or atom-like systems a kind of route towards, uh, preferred route towards quantum information processing, quantum networks, or realizing strong interactions at the level of single photons. Um, so kind of one strange thing about this game is even though single atoms naturally produce single uh, photons or single particles of light, it's actually very unnatural for single atoms and photons to talk to each other efficiently. And one way you can kind of understand that quantitatively is if you imagine you had a single atom trapped and you focus a Gaussian laser beam onto it with some beam area A, the probability that a single resonant photon in this beam will interact with or scatter off that single atom is given by some kind of scattering cross-section of um, the atomic, uh, in this case, the transition wavelength squared, divided by the beam area. So on one hand, this result is pretty remarkable because the uh, uh, the resonant wavelength is much bigger than the physical size of the atom, but this number is not enough to be kind of close to 100% because you have to obey the diffraction limit in free space. Um, so there's some kind of popular fixes for that to get close to kind of 100%. One is to put the atom in a high finesse cavity. In that case, the interaction is enhanced by the number of bounces that that single photon can make uh, with the single, or can, can uh, make off the mirrors and interact with the single atom again and again. And in cavity QD language, that's known as G squared over kappa gamma, or as a cavity cooperativity. Um, instead of using a single atom, you can also try, try using many. In that case, the interaction probably is enhanced by the number of atoms. And in atomic physics language, this parameter is known as the optical depth. Um, so these parameters of cooperativity and optical depth, uh, they're, they're widely viewed as kind of fundamental limits to anything you want to do involving atom light interfaces. Um, so there's just kind of hundreds of examples of that in the literature. Here's a kind of experiment from uh, Gerd Rempe's group where they try to realize a gate between a photon and, and an atom in a cavity. And just to highlight some text in that paper, they say, in principle, this gate is deterministic, except sometimes it doesn't work because we have a finite cooperativity factor. Uh, there's another kind of similar uh, idea, this time to realize a kind of nonlinear optical system, so a single photon transistor. Again, it just doesn't work perfectly because you have a finite cooperativity. Um, there's a really nice paper from Alexei Gorshkov where they analyze um, a quantum memory for light. So the idea is you can send in a single photon into an atomic ensemble and try to somehow absorb that photon coherently into a, some kind of internal excitation of the atoms and then retrieve it later. So there's a lot of different ways you can imagine doing that, like EIT and, and so on. Uh, one really nice conclusion about this paper, though, is um, uh, this says, you know, all these approaches, at least when you optimize it, it yields the same max, yields the identical maximum efficiency which only depends on the optical depth of the system. And one of the big problems in practice is that if you analyze how well do these kind of applications perform as a function of cooperative or optical depth, um, the errors shrink pretty slowly, like one over cooperativity or one over optical depth, or even slower. So that's a one over a square root of optical depth. Um, so um, I think there's a kind of interesting, so you know, this, is, this kind of uh, summary of you know, everything just boils down to the scattering cross-section of an atom. You can ask, is that the full story? Sorry? Oh, so in the case of a photon storage, um, the idea is you, can, you send in a photon of some given pulse shape. You try to absorb it coherently with the atoms and try to retrieve it later on. So here, error means that you send something in, but like nothing came out. So you lost the photon to some other channel, let's say. Um, 
So uh, the question I'd like to kind of pose here is, is that the full story? So if we just take the case of atomic ensembles as a specific example, we can ask, where does this linear scaling in number of atoms come from in an abstract sense? So the kind of assumption is that, you know, the atoms are kind of acting and, 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 and succeeding or failing independently, right? So it's like if the first atom fails, the next atom has a chance to succeed. If that one fails, then the third atom has a chance to succeed, and so on. So it's a kind of idea that atoms are interacting with the light one, you know, particle by particle. Um, but we know that it can't be true, right? So, um, you know, technically, if we just think about just classical wave scattering, atoms are just dipole scatters. And these atoms have to emit waves, and these waves have to interfere with each other. Okay, so it can't be an independent process. And so if you want this process of interference, um, you know, the historically you might call it the physics of super and subradiance. So that's what my talk is going to focus on uh, at some level, especially the physics of, of subradiance. So I'll get to what that really means in more detail later on. But probably most of you have at least heard these words before. Um, so one thing I want to emphasize is what I find kind of remarkable is that you, really your kind of starting equations for atom-light interactions already have an issue. Okay? Um, so in particular, if you take the James Cummings model for multiple atoms, um, so you get the normal kind of James Cummings term where you know, one atom can emit a photon into the cavity and that photon can be reabsorbed. As an open system, you have to put in some cavity losses. But then you also have to put in for a realistic system the idea that you know, this, this cavity is not a closed box. So when you excite an atom, it can emit out of the cavity in 4 pi. And in the kind of normal models of atom-light interactions, it's just assumed or put in by hands that that, uh, that in emission is independent. Okay? So it's not fundamental. It's just put in there by hands, presumably to make these equations easier to solve. Um, when you write down the Maxwell block equations for atomic ensembles, you start with some kind of wave equation where your electric field couples to some continuous uh, atomic polarization density. Um, uh, and then on and then for the atomic polarization density, you write down what looks like a block equation. And again, you see there's the same assumption. If you have some uh, excited state, ground state coherence, or some excited state population, it decays at a rate that's independent of what any of the other atoms are doing. Okay. Um, so the question is, if you try to relax that constraint and really try to solve the full kind of three, you know, the full three-dimensional problem, can you somehow exploit that interference to enhance atom-light interfaces? Turns out the answer would be yes. Um, to understand that answer, uh, this, the rest of the talk is basically broken down into three parts. Um, first, I'm going to introduce a formalism that allows you to calculate the atom-light interactions, including all the interference into 4 pi. Um, then I'll talk about where subradiance comes from, uh, at least for ordered atomic rays in free space. It turns out that um, subradiance has a really nice kind of physical intuition in terms of guided modes of that atomic array. And then I'll talk about selective radiance, um, which is uh, the kind of mechanism that you'll need to enhance an atom-light interface. Um, so instead of going through the normal channels of Maxwell block equations or James Cummings model, um, I'd like to introduce a kind of alternative way of, of diver deriving a kind of um, uh, atom-light interaction model that's quantum mechanical. Um, so the key part of this story is going to be the electromagnetic Green's function. So formally, the Green's function is just the solution to the uh, electromagnetic wave equation in the frequency domain, given a point function source. So this is the mathematical uh, equation that the Green's function satisfies. What it physically describes is, imagine you have some uh, oscillating dipole um, at position r prime. It starts to emit some kind of dipole pattern. Um, you're allowed to have some materials with permittivity epsilon nearby. And the Green's function is basically the answer to this question. If I put an oscillating dipole at r prime, What's the total field I see at a position R, including all the possible rescattering? Okay. So technically, the Green's function is a, is a tensor quantity. Um, so this alpha and beta can be x, y, or z. And that's physically because this dipole here can have three orientations. And then the field at position R can also have three vector orientations. So in all the numerical calculations we do going forward, we do take into account that tensor quantity. But I'm going to kind of hide it just for the simplicity uh, of, of the discussion in, in these slides. Um, so you might not call it a Green's function, but everyone knows at least one example of a Green's function, uh, and in particular that of empty space. Again, in empty space, the Green's function is just the kind of famous dipole pattern uh, of an os oscillating uh, dipole. Um, so a priori, you have a lot of degrees of freedom. You, you potentially have a lot of atoms, and then you also have the continuum of electromagnetic field modes. And so one thing that turns out is um, the light, even though you're interested in its properties, you can turn out, it turns out that you can get rid of it as the very first step. 
And that actually makes life in some sense much easier uh, when it comes to solving for the full atom light interactions. So to see that's possible, let me give a classical analogy. Imagine I have some input field, which I presume I know, for example, a Gaussian, and then it interacts with some classical dipolarizable scatterers. So the instant field can excite these dipoles, and they, want to, and they can rescatter. And I'm interested in finding the total field at some detection point, R. So I know the radiation pattern for dipoles, just encoded in the Green's function. So formally, I can write down some kind of what looks like an input-output equation, which formally says that the total field at some detection point is the field I send in, plus that which is rescattered by my dipoles. So classically, that certainly is intuitive and true. And the point is, this equation is quantum mechanical, but it's true as well. Okay, so when I replace my electric field with an, with an operator, and when I replace my classical dipoles with the atomic coherence operator, this equation is still true. And that's because when you say it's a quantum field or quantum state of light, the quantumness is really encoded in the correlations of the field or, let's say, of the sources. But the way that the classical field and quantum field propagate, they both obey Maxwell's equations, so it's still the same Green's function in there. Oh, yeah, okay, so, right, so that's a really good point. So that's the one assumption that's built into this equation. So technically, if this was not an equation in time, but it was an equation for frequency, then it would be exact. So um, once you, uh, but, then, you know, but then when you Fourier transform that into time, generically you get retardation. What saves the day, particularly in the case of atomic systems, is that you know, real atoms, they have a very, very narrow uh, spectral response, right? So the, uh, within a few uh, emission line widths, kind of a few megahertz, you know, the atoms go from strongly responding to light to being completely transparent. So in other words, the atoms have much more dispersion than a typical free space propagation given by the Green's function, which means that in practice you can ignore this Green's function's uh, dispersion, unless you're talking about some like extreme system. So if the atoms are separated by more than the length of an emitted photon, then obviously retardation becomes important. Or if you have some very special dielectric surroundings, like a very high Q cavity, and you enter the strong coupling regime of cavity QED, then this equation also would break down. But aside from those kind of counterexamples, this is a, a generically true equation, at least for atomic uh, system. Oh yeah, so sorry. Um, so this is formally exact. What you don't know yet is what, what, are, the, what are the atoms doing themselves, right? Um, so that part I'll get to in the, in the next slide. Um, but the point about this input-output equation, it says that you know, the field is not a real independent degree of freedom. All the correlations of the field or all the information is contained in the correlations of the atoms themselves. Um, so then the next question is what you said, what are the atoms actually doing? Um, so you can imagine if you start from the full atom fields uh, Hamiltonian, uh, you can write down a Heisenberg equation of motion for the atoms, and the atoms, of course, will be driven by the fields. But from the previous slide, you know that the field, themselves, the field is just dependent on all the other atoms. So in the end, the, the effective equation you get for the atoms only depends on the other atoms. And so you can derive the effective atomic dynamics from a purely what I call spin Hamiltonian. Okay? So this Hamiltonian maybe looks a little bit abstract, but if you look at it in a little bit more detail, it kind of makes intuitive sense. So the type of spin interaction basically says that one atom, J, can go from the excited state to the ground state, and another atom, I, can go from ground to excited state. So that's naturally what kind of photon emission and reabsorption would do. And then the strength of that interaction is just given by the Green's function and how the field propagates from atom I to atom J. Um, so if you could solve... Oh, so one thing that's important to point out is this uh, effective Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian. Okay, so this Green's function is complex. So technically this Green's function, or this Hamiltonian, contains both... Uh, encodes both coherent dynamics, so real kind of population exchange between atoms. But it also encodes spontaneous emission, in particular collective spontaneous emission. So if you want to turn this into a kind of full pro proper theory for a quantum open system, you have to add quantum jumps into the story. Um, so there are jump operators. I won't write them down here because they're not so important for the discussion. But you, know, you could do it, and that's a full kind of theory for atom-light interactions. Um, so these are kind of the basic starting points of this kind of different formulation of atom-light interactions. Um, these equations certainly aren't new. So there's you know, many different kind of incarnations of these equations over the years. Um, but even though they're not new, I think it's fair to say that maybe these equations haven't been taken fully seriously or the consequences haven't been fully appreciated. 
in particular, um, you know, these equations, they treat um, atoms and light um, in a kind of very equal way. So basically, you know, this set of equations, it describes equally any system of atoms interacting with light. So in principle, you could apply it to cavity QED, you could apply it to atoms in free space, atomic ensembles, you could apply it to atoms near very complex nanophotonic structures. All you have to do is plug in the correct Green's function appropriate for that system. Uh, and the second thing that's quite, quite unique about these equations is it says, you know, if you want to understand atom-light interactions, you want to solve for them, what it really boils down to is solving this kind of open interacting spin system. Okay? So we, had to, we have to kind of put on our condensed matter hats and learn how to solve spin physics. Um, so, uh, these kind of, so these equations are pretty broad. I think they have a lot of consequence. Um, let me try to give just a very brief uh, example of some of the consequences. So on one hand, you can use it to understand subradiance in, in atomic arrays. So that's the topic of this talk. Uh, you can also imagine kind of two-dimensional arrays of atoms in free space. It turns out you can use these equations to show those topological excitations contained in these arrays and edge states and so on. Um, you can also use these equations to quantitatively model um, experiments for atom-light interactions of very complex dielectric geometries, such as photonic crystals. Um, once you view atom-light interactions as a spin system, um, you get you know, a kind of whole new toolbox of, of, of tricks at your disposal. So for example, you can try using things like matrix product states or tensor networks to, to describe uh, the, the physics of interacting spin systems. Um, from there, reconstruct you know, the potentially complex dynamics of quantum fields interacting with atoms. Um, and the last thing, which it just kind of came out in the past few weeks, um, which I'm pretty astounded by, is um, there's a postdoc in my group who said, I think I can just use these equations to brute force model an atomic ensemble in three dimensions. So here's an example of uh, three level systems. There's 50,000 atoms in this cloud. So these atoms are just kind of put down by hand in some kind of Gaussian distribution corresponding to a trap. I'm going to send in a photon, so the optical depth is about 50. I just want to directly see electromagnetically induced transparency. So let me show this movie if I can. Okay. So you see a field coming in. One thing about EIT is it's a, it basically creates a very slow group velocity. So you send in a field, it gets totally compressed inside the atomic medium, and then it propagates out on the other sides. Um, so it certainly gives you the physics of uh, you know, the toy models of EIT, but you also see some truly three-dimensional effects. So for example, once the movie has stopped, the field apparently has completely left the system. But if you look carefully at the spin population, you still, still see some you know, red dots left over. And that encodes the physics of radiation trapping and lensing and so on. So I think these kind of spin equations, they're very potentially, uh, they're, they're potentially usable in a lot of different manifestations. Um, so just for concreteness, let's try to apply this to uh, a, a simple system. So a 1D chain of atoms living in three-dimensional free space. So again, here's our spin model in general. And then if we want atoms in free space, we just have to plug in the correct Green's function. So for this Green's function, we just put in the famous dipole pattern. And we furthermore have to specify a geometry. So let's take n atoms in a row, uh, separated by some well-defined lattice constant d, but again, living in a three-dimensional space. So if I have n atoms and they're two-level systems, that's potentially a big Hilbert space of 2 to the n. To simplify it a little bit more, I can just assume that there's just one excitation in the system. So this is if you want the regime of linear optics. So in that case, the Hilbert space reduces dramatically. In that case, there's just n possible states. So for example, the first atom can be excited, the second one, or the third one, or so on. And in this reduced Hilbert space, this Hamiltonian just becomes some n by n matrix, which is where the matrix elements are given by the Green's function elements themselves. So not knowing anything about the system, or not having any intuition, you can still at least plug it into a computer and just numerically diagonalize. So if you have n atoms, generically you're going to have uh, n uh, excited states, n collective modes. Um, each collective mode, so if you index it by alpha, it's generally going to be some superposition of different atoms excited. So here's just you know, one particular eigenstate where you see that the spatial excitation looks a little bit like half a standing wave uh, pattern. Um, so these are the eigenstates themselves, and you can also look at the eigenvalues. They're going to be complex because it's an open system. Um, so the real part of the eigenvalue is going to physically describe some frequency shift of each collective mode. Uh, it's going to be some frequency shift away from the bare atomic transition frequency, omega eg, due to basically photon exchange. Um, at the same time, the imaginary part of this eigenvalue is going to give you some kind of decay rate, and that can be bigger or smaller than the free space uh, single atom decay rate gamma naught, 
And the fact that it's bigger or smaller, that encodes the physics of superradiance or subradiance. Um, so if you just take a kind of numerical example, you could, for example, plug in 30 atoms, and then you could just choose some uh, lattice constant d. For example, d is you know, 2.1 times the resonant wavelength. So you take that Hamiltonian, you diagonalize it, you get 30 different eigenstates. And what I'm plotting here on this vertical cut, vertical cut is those 30 different resonance frequencies. Um, so you see these 30 different resonance frequencies, they're all pretty close to uh, the bare atomic frequency, so less than one emission line width away. So what this basically says is when atoms are separated by a large distance of several wavelengths, yes, technically there's these dipole-dipole interactions, but more or less the atoms are responding independently. Um, so you can do the same thing for not, the, uh, not for the level shifts, but for the decay rates. Again, you find 30 different decay rates, so you see that they're, very close to, uh, they're all very close to the single atom isolated emission rate. So you can do this calculation just for smaller and smaller lattice constants d. So that's what I'm uh, showing in this set of plots here. So as you get down to one wavelength and half a wavelength, the spread in resonance frequencies and decay rates gets bigger and bigger. But once you get below lambda over 2, or the last constant, you see very qualitatively different behavior. You see a set of atomic excitations with nearly zero decay rate. So you can ask, you know, how close is it to zero? So you can replot that on a log scale. You find a thousand-fold of suppression. And if you analyze it more carefully, what you find is that as a function of atom number, the longest decay rate, or the smallest decay rate in the system, gets suppressed by like, number of atoms to the third power. Okay. So really, these collective excitations and these interference can really matter at close distances. Um, so that's just the numerics, and then you can ask, you know, you know to some intuition of where this physics comes from. So for intuition, it turns out to be really nice to analyze an infinite extended system. So if you have an infinite lattice, one thing that's nice about an infinite periodic system is you know that all the eigenstates have to obey Bloch's theorem. So a generic eigenstate, psi of k, for an infinite system, is going to be some superposition of atom j being in the excited state with some phase e to the i kz, and that k, of course, is just the Bloch wave vector of the system. So you can try to diagonalize the Hamiltonian and represent the, the spectrum by a block band structure. So here's an empty band diagram so far. On the vertical axis is going to be the um, resonance frequency of each block mode. On the k-vector, uh, on the horizontal axis, is going to be the block wave vector. And of course, the block wave vector is only unique up until the, within the first free one zone, so up until pi over the lattice constant. Um, so one thing I've drawn in here is just the bare atomic resonance frequency. So if you want the specific band structure, of course, you just have to go and numerically solve the system. But one thing that you can say that's pretty generic about atoms is, again, atoms have a very narrow spectral response. Okay? So they only really talk to light within a few line widths of, of uh, the resonance frequency. So you can imagine that generically, you know, regardless of what exact shape the band structure has, generically you expect that its width to be on the order of the single atom free space emission rate. So what that means in practice is simply that this band is going to be very, very flat. Right? Because a typical atomic transition frequency is going to be several hundred terahertz, but then the line width is just a few megahertz. Um, on top of that, you can also draw in omega equals ck. So that's just the dispersion relation of light in empty space. Um, it turns out to be convenient to draw in because, you know, so far I was talking about the spin part of the problem. But when you have atoms that are excited, they're generically going to create some electromagnetic field as well. And because it's a periodic system, the electromagnetic field itself also has to apply also has to obey Bloch's theorem. So if you were to take a plane wave decomposition of the electric field associated with this excitation, along the z direction, along the chain of the axis, uh, the k vector has to be that of the spin wave. But because the electromagnetic field lives in three dimensions, there's also going to be some transverse wave vector as well. And so you, uh, in Maxwell's equations, they enforce that you know, the sum of the parallel and uh, perpendicular wave vector squared has to be equal to omega over c squared. So basically what you can conclude is that this dispersion relation omega equals ck separates two very different kinds of solutions. In particular, when you're beyond the light line, in particular if you're living in this part of the triangle or this triangle here, then k itself is already bigger than omega over c. And so that implies that k perpendicular, the transverse component of the wave vector, has to be imaginary. And that corresponds to some kind of evanescent or guided mode. And so from that, you can immediately conclude that um, you know, in this region here, um, the spin excitations, they couple to radiation fields. That gives a channel for the atomic energy to escape out to infinity. And so these states in here should have a non-zero decay rate, while the states out here have to have a zero decay rate. 
because the electromagnetic field that these states create are evanescent, and they can't uh, you know, propagate energy out in the transverse direction to infinity. So these are perfectly subradiant modes with exactly zero decay rate. And so that's one of the kind of big punchlines of this story. Um, one nice thing about ordered arrays of atomic systems is that subradiance is just guided mode physics. Okay? So if you understand optical fibers, then you understand the properties of these subradiant excitations. Um, so the only condition for subradiance to exist um, in this one-dimensional example is that you have to have some atomic states here beyond the light line. Um, in other words, you have to have that omega equals CK intersects the Brewan zone above the bare atomic transition frequency. And if you convert that into distance, what you find that is it's equivalent to saying that the last constant has to be smaller than lambda over 2. So that's what we indeed saw in the numerical case for a finite system. Um, going back to the finite system, uh, in that case, we found a, a small but non-zero decay rate. And we can simply interpret that as you know, having a, simply a finite-sized fiber. So when you have a finite-sized fiber, it'll guide light up until the, light, the point where the light hits the end of the fiber, and then light will spray off. And one nice thing about this input-output equation is you can take the most subradiant spin state, you can reconstruct the electromagnetic field, and indeed that's what you see. So all the energy of this subradiant state is simply being leaked off the fiber-guided mode ends. Um, so one nice thing about this kind of intuition is you see that you know, even though this word subradiance has to be 50 years old, you know, it's very hard to see subradiance. So to me, the first convincing uh, observation of subradiance in an extended atomic system was just last year. Um, and from this intuition, you can kind of at least see why. So imagine that you know, when you have a chain of atoms or an atomic collection, the way you always talk to these atoms is just by shining in a laser. Right? But a laser, by definition, is composed of radiation waves. In other words, the laser, no matter what angle you point it at, it always lives inside the light line here. But the special states that we're talking about live outside. So there's just a kind of fundamental impedance mismatch or wave vector mismatch. It's exactly like if you take a real optical fiber and you shine a laser directly on it to its body, you don't really notice that it's a cool optical device because you can't launch guided modes that way. Um, so if you really want to, so you know, if you want to excite these states out here, you somehow need to overcome this impedance mismatch. Uh, one natural way to do that is with some other set of guided modes, in particular, an optical nanofiber. Um, so in the past few years, uh, this kind of system has been an experimental, has become experimental reality. So what you can do is you can take a normal uh, optical fiber, glass fiber, you can pull it under a flame until it's really thin. Um, in that case, when it, once it's thin enough, um, even though it guides light, a lot of the light actually lives outside the fiber core and in the vacuum region as an evanescent field. Um, so these evanescent fields you can actually use to trap uh, many atoms around the fiber um, and then interface those atoms with near-resonant guided modes. Um, so here's a kind of cartoon picture of what you would see if you just had one atom trapped near a fiber and you were to bring it up to excited state. You would see maybe about 10% of the time that excitation uh, is spontaneously emitted in the form of a guided photon in the waveguide, and about 90% of the time it would be emitted into free space. Okay, so there's these two relevant decay rates, gamma 1d, the guided mode decay rate, and gamma prime, which is the free space emission rate. Um, and the point is, if you can now get an ordered chain of atoms near this fiber, um, the previously subradiant states of this atomic chain can now talk to the guided modes of the fiber. So here's the kind of cartoon picture of that. Um, the blue curve here is what I showed before. So this is the dispersion relation of atomic chain. Um, you have these subradiant states outside the light line. But the fiber mode, because the fiber guides light, it's also evanescent um, you know, as well in, in the vacuum region. And so the fiber mode dispersion relation also lives outside the light line. And where these two modes, interact, where these two modes intersect, you expect that you can have very efficient coupling. So if they intersect, it turns out that you know, I kind of changed the story on you a little bit. They're not going to be subradiant atomic excitations anymore, because now these atomic excitations see a channel of light to talk to just fine. So they can perfectly emit into the fiber mode. Um, so we don't call it subradiance, we call it selective radiance. But it turns out that's perfect. That's exactly what you want to create an enhanced atom light interface. Because again, the name of the game in atom light interfaces is to achieve 100% interaction probability. You want that the atoms talk 100% of the time to the mode that you want, the mode that you dictate, and none of the time to the modes that you don't want, which in this case is free space. So you can use this notion of selective radiance to try and beat these conventional optical depth limits. 
Um, so to, to, to say that we can beat conventional limits, we have to kind of reintroduce a conventional description of atom light interactions near a nanofiber, and that's what I'll call the independent emission model. So it's some kind of model where you know, the atoms are allowed to talk, in, to, to talk in a collectively enhanced way to the guided modes of the fiber, but you assume, you put in by hand, that if an atom is excited, it will emit into free space at an independent rate, gamma prime. And then on the other hand, we can use this kind of full Green's function, uh, and that's what we'll call the collective emission model. So we're trying to account exactly for how light is emitted into free space, and trying to suppress that by this kind of impedance mismatch. Um, so the way we do that is, again, we just go back to our kind of Green's function formulation. If you have a cylindrical fiber, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, it's painful, but you can you know, solve for the Green's function exactly by just kind of big exercise in vessel functions. So that's what we do numerically. Um, so to pick out one particular application, let's look at a quantum memory for light. Um, so the cartoon picture is like this. Imagine I have a bunch of atoms in the ground state. I send in a single photon. And that single photon uh, will be absorbed by the atoms in some coherent way. And you'll create one atomic excitation that's kind of extended uh, in the system. Okay, so if you want, this is the kind of storage part. You're converting a photon to a material excitation. And then um, the, the other part of the memory is that you can retrieve it. So once you have this atomic excitation, that excitation will de-excite and hopefully relaunch a guided mode photon back into the waveguide. Um, so by time reversal symmetry, these two processes of the storage and the retrieval, um, the optimal efficiencies should be identical. And for technical reasons, it's just easier uh, analytically or uh, to analyze the reverse process, where you start with some uh, uh, excited state superposition, and you study with what efficiency that excited state superposition launches a guided photon into the waveguide. Um, so to really talk about quantum memory, there's one more kind of atomic physics trick you have to introduce. So if you only use two-level systems, it's not really a quantum memory that you can control. Right? Because once this photon is absorbed, you turn into an excited state. That excited state is just going to re-emit that photon immediately. Um, so to get a kind of retrieval on demand, so at a timing that you want, you can simply go to a three-level system. This is the physics of electromagnetically induced transparency. So instead of having a two-level system, you add a third level, a third ground state S. Um, when you send in the photon, it'll be absorbed into the state E. But then you can use a big classical control field to simply take that state E and, for example, Raman flip it um, into the state S. Okay? And the state S is going to be stable because it's another ground state. And then you can also do the reverse process. If you start with um, a single atom in S in some superposition, you can apply this big classical control field and retrieve a, that excitation as a guided photon in the waveguide. So if you go through the independent emission model, model uh, the independent emission model, what you find is that um, you get an error that scales like 5.8 times the single atom emission rate into the free space, divided by a number of atoms times the single atom emission rate into the waveguide. So this combination of parameters here is just the optical depth. And so this scaling, which we find for the waveguide, it's also known for, for free space. So this is the paper that I showed you in one of the original uh, slides. Okay, so the error only decreases like one of optical depth with a pretty big coefficient in front. So now in the collective emission model, you can just try to analyze the system numerically. So you take your Hamiltonian, which you construct numerically, and you can find all the eigenstates, and you can just simply look for the eigenstate with the biggest branching ratio of emission into the waveguide versus free space. So if you just do it numerically and you analyze it, what you find is that the error of this uh, storage and retrieval process has a function of n. So the top plot here is this independent emission model that has this 1 over n scaling. And now this collective emission gives you a 1 over n squared. Okay? So we're certainly beating uh, the independent emission model by this kind of suppressed emission into free space. So that's not bad, but it's also not really ideal either. In particular, you know, we automatically get a 1 over n just from collective enhancement into the waveguide. That's where this independent emission model 1 over n comes from in the first place. So we're really only getting a 1 over n suppression of the emission into uh, into free space. Okay? Um, but that's not really ideal in the sense that, you know, when we ju just analyze the free space atomic chain, we already saw that there are subradiant states which have a decay rate that's suppressed like 1 over n cubed. So it kind of seems like there's powers of n that are just disappearing on us somewhere. Um, and again, you can try to figure out why. And the beautiful thing about uh, this kind of subradiance is, again, it's just kind of optical fiber physics. 
So let's say you have one kind of optical fiber. That would just be this kind of bare fiber here without any atoms. It guides light perfectly. And if you have this kind of fiber with an uh, order chain of atoms on top, that composite system also guides light just perfectly. But anytime you have two different fibers in a lab and you try to put them together, you know there's a problem, right? Because there's going to be some impedance mismatch at the interface, which causes a lot of light scattering. So if you want to fix that problem experimentally, you have to simply buy a fiber connector. Okay? Um, so in this case, the fiber connector is not something you just buy from Thor Labs, but it's something that you can construct. So in the previous analysis, our kind of classical control field, our pump field, was spatially uniform. Um, but one way you can tailor the system is to have a spatially non-uniform field. In particular, you can make the control field at the ends very large. So if you're familiar with atomic physics and EIT, um, it's a kind of technical reason why, but in EIT, your transparency bandwidth is proportional to your control field intensity. So when you make the control field intensity very large, effectively you're making the atoms at the end have a, have, a, have a refractive index that's very close to one. So it's like the atoms at the end are almost invisible to the light, and then the atomic response turns on slowly once you enter the bulk of the atomic system. So it just kind of smooths out the atomic response to the incident fields. And when you take, now when you take this kind of spatially non-uniform control field and you do the same analysis, you find that the error versus number of atoms is now exponential. Okay, so we can do exponentially better than the previously known bounds. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, so I think this is really fascinating because, again, it's just really surprising to me that equation one for atom-light interactions in textbook is already wrong. But you build in some assumption of independent emission, and when you do that, you have a pretty good sense of what you can and can't do for all the different applications of atomic ensembles, you know, quantum memory, nonlinear optics, metrology, and so on. But once you understand that, that, you know, that those equations have this independent emission, which is just kind of tossed in there by hands, you can ask, what's the real story? So this Green's function formalism, the spin model, gives you a way to start you know, answering that without any kind of pre-built-in assumptions. Um, so one thing that's fascinating to me is, you know, at least along this, one, you know, along this one line of applications, quantum memory, you know, the, the real realm of possibilities is exponentially better than what people knew about before. And so that's just one example, but I think it would be really fascinating you know, in the next few years to really explore all the different possible applications of atom light interfaces and just ask, you know, how many of these walls can we go and smash? Another thing that I think is really fascinating is, you know, all these kind of uh, atom light interactions, for example, in this quantum memory, we were analyzing it simply by solving a spin model. So, of course, solving a spin model, a generic spin model, of, uh, generically is not easy. You know, it's an interacting system. In this case, it's open. It's a long-range interaction. But to view atom-light interactions just formally as a spin model, I think can potentially, can potentially give rise to a lot of you know, different insights into uh, atom-light interactions. Um, so since it looks like I have uh, a couple minutes left, um, let me just present you know, two more slides, which at least kind of goes along this direction of, of you know, these different applications. So in the case of a quantum memory, we're really concerned with just a single atomic excitation. So this is the regime of linear optics. You know, you don't really need two-level atoms. If I had some magical classical polarizable resonant dipoles, I would also get the same physics. Um, but then most of the applications involving atoms and light, you send in many photons. You have many excitations. So the natural question to ask is, you know, do you have these subradiant states for multiple excitations? So if it's just linear optics, the, the answer would be trivial. You know, if I just have an optical fiber, it guides one photon perfectly. If I have two or ten, it also guides those, those photons perfectly. Um, but the, the fact that we have spins here makes it a very different story. So to make that uh, discussion concrete, imagine that I just look at the most subradiant single excitation state, so I can define some collective spin-raising operator acting on the global ground state which prepares uh, the kind of subradiant uh, superposition of one atom, J, being excited with these amplitudes, C, J. And then the next thing you can ask is, well, what if I try to create the same excitation twice? Okay, so this is a two excitation state. Um, is it going to be a subradiant eigenstate of the system? If it's inter non-interacting bosons, if it's just an optical fiber, the answer is certainly yes. Those two excitations decay at a rate that's twice that of a single excitation. But because it spins, the answer is no, and it's very much no. Um, to see that, uh, you can take this uh, two-excitation state, you can generically write it in this form. So pairs of atoms, I and J, are excited. 
and the CIJ is the kind of two X station amplitude. And if you just plot out in space, so here's CIJ squared, here's J and I on the X and Y axes. Of course, because it's a two-level system, you can't excite the same spin twice. So this 2x station wave function looks relatively smooth, except for this kind of giant kink down the middle. And anytime you have a wave function in space that has that kind of very sharp feature, in momentum space, it's going to be very broad. So this 2x station state in momentum space actually has a lot of momentum components that live inside the light line, and that kills the subradiance. This 2x station state can now efficiently radiate into free space. Um, so if you want to construct a many-body radiant uh, many-body subradiant state, uh, you should simply take that int intuition and run with it. So we know that subradiant states should sa simultaneously satisfy that they have wave vectors living beyond the light line, and they should be spatially non-overlapping to avoid these kinks in the wave function. And if you want to satisfy these two constraints at the same time, that sounds a lot like Pauli exclusion or fermionic physics. So for example, if you want to create a two-excitation subradiant state, you can take your two uh, single excitation, most subradiant states, and you can construct an anti-symmetric two excitation wave function out of that. So when you plot that two excitation wave function, you see that there's this, this kind of smooth repulsion. Um, and when you analyze the decay rate, it preserves this kind of one over n cubed scaling. So that's a kind of just initial result, but I kind of find that kind of fascinating. What this implies is that the many body subradiance problem is intrinsically a rich many body problem. It's like the physics of, of fermions. Um, so with that, uh, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. So I have uh, one already. So, so about orders of magnitude. Uh, uh, so, so you have two level systems. Uh, are you driving resonantly or how far are you driving from the resonance? And Oh, um, so I guess there's two parts. Um, when I was analyzing the eigenstates, those are just you know, the natural modes of the system. So I didn't tell you anything about how to prepare it you know, from, from sending light in. But it kind of gives you a sense of what are the natural decay rates. Um, in the case of this photon storage, you can shine light in just anywhere near resonance. So it turns out not to depend on the particular detuning that you send in. You can always achieve, um, what's more important is like the, the spatial timing or sorry, the, the temporal timing. So you send in the correct shape wave function, and whether it's on resonance or off resonance, if you optimize the storage process, it turns out not to matter. And that's also true in, in free space ensembles as well. So there's a lot of different you know, off resonant tricks and on resonant tricks for photon storage. Um, there's differences just for technical reasons, but fundamentally they have the same efficiency. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, so um, if you solve the, this Hamiltonian dynamics exactly, it includes all this multiple scattering to all orders. Um, so the, the bottleneck is that potentially you can't solve that many-body spin problem exactly, and then you would have to resort to different approximations. But, but if you can solve the, the Hamiltonian dynamics exactly, it includes the multiple scattering to, uh, to all orders. Uh, here, do you consider uh, coupling only to the guided mode because uh, there will be coupling to the radiation modes also, and which can be quite dominant. To the radiation modes. Yeah. Um, and how does the like the super radiance and sub radiance get modified if you consider the radius coupling to the radiation mode also? Um, so, in in everything we, so in all this analysis here, like the coupling to all the modes. Is, is solved for exactly. I mean, in this particular example of quantum memory, uh, we're trying to suppress that as much as we could you know, to realize this efficient interface with the guided modes. And we see that that's kind of exponentially better than what people thought was possible. Um, I guess it is possible, instead of working with the guided modes, you could try to you know, talk to one of the super radiant modes to free space on purpose. Um, we just have a... a so it's possible to analyze in this formalism, but we don't have any specific examples where we did, where we did it carefully, and, and that I can point you to some particularly interesting phenomenon. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you.